having me. This is quite an honor. Um, a little bit intimidating, first Terry talk ever. I'm feeling the pressure, especially since it's being filmed, but um, I'm really honored that you guys would want to hear from me. Um, even though I don't think that my story is necessarily very inspiring or extraordinary, I do think that as humans we're all much more alike than we are different. And so if you can learn something from my story or if I can help you pause to think about your own journey, then I think maybe we'll accomplish something good today. So, you guys know I still get nervous when I talk in front of you. <laughs> um, apologize for the notes, but this is gonna help keep me on track. So, what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about my life so far, and if I had to give this Terry talk a name, I would probably call it Life in Progress. My ter story is a Terry story, much like yours, and my journey to and through college um, is probably pretty similar. But today, at age 47, and 30 years almost since my selection as a Terry Scholar, as I look back on my life, I can see patterns and phases that helped me get where I am today. So right now, I think I'm in my third phase of adult life, and I know I'm not done yet. So what I'm gonna do is talk about how I got to where I am today. So first, I think you should know that I do not believe that I'm the architect of my life. I'm a Christian, and faith is going to be woven into my whole story. It's not something that I'm going to dwell on, but it's very much a part of me. I also value that we come from many different cultures and religions, and I have extreme respect for all of that. So I'm not telling you that my way is necessarily your way, but I hope we can find some common ground. So let me just say again that I don't think I'm the architect of my life, but I might be the engineer or the project manager is maybe a better term. There may be times when I can't control my circumstances in life, but I can control how I will react. And on a more frequent base, I will control the path that I will take in life. So as a project manager, I think we all need some tools in our toolbox, and I brought a few with me that we're going to talk about. Uh, but first, let me go back and start from the beginning, the beginning of my Terry story, and we'll call that phase one. So I grew up in a small town, just like many of you, graduated at the top of my class, and I experienced a lot of success along the way. I was really fortunate to have a lot of people in my life who encouraged me to do my best. I had wonderful parents, great teachers, a lot of inspirational coaches in my life, and I was really very blessed. I was taught and I believed that you can be anything you want to be. And so because I loved math and science, I wanted to be an engineer. Now, never mind that I had never met an engineer, had no idea what they did, and really had no idea how to get there. <laughs> so. Texas A&M was the only school that I applied to, and being a first-generation college student, there was a lot of uncertainty about the path I would take. But like many of you, I had really big dreams. I knew my parents could not afford to send me to college, but back then, in the 80s, taking out a few thousand dollars a year to get through college didn't seem unreasonable. So my path to becoming a Terry Scholar is really very different from all of you because it was the first year. And we can talk about that later if you're really curious. But what's important is that my interview was the same. Six people on one side of the table and me on the other. I, like many of you, will never forget that interview. And of course, my interview had Howard and Nancy Terry on the other side. Rhett Campbell and the three other board of directors at the time. Um, so ultimately, I was selected to be one of the first six Terry Scholars at Texas A&M, and I knew then that I would be forever grateful for that opportunity. So college is paid for, and I jumped right in. But man, it was hard. It was really <laughs> hard. So my first semester, I got a 3-5, best semester ever, thank you. High school, college, uh, high school physics and calculus, really great preparation, but every semester after that got harder and harder. 
Many of the times I felt like I was barely keeping my head above water, really just surviving. And so here we get to our first tool, measuring tape. For the first time in my life, I began to wonder whether I was going to measure up. I wondered, did I fit in? Was I prepared? I wondered if I was going to make it to the end. A lot of doubts and insecurities that I had really never faced in my life before. The great thing about that measuring tape is that you get to set the scale. 25 feet of tape on that measure, but I don't necessarily need to use it all. So ultimately, I had to determine my own measure of success. And for me, that was not achieving a 4.0 every semester. That just was not realistic. When I almost failed physics, I had to have a tutor for the first time in my life, and I earned my first C. When it came around to thermo and statics and dynamics, earning that C seemed like a great accomplishment. <laughs> So I learned to take one class and one semester at a time, to do my best and to be satisfied that my best was enough. But here's where Howard Terry comes into play. See, I had always been surrounded by people that had encouraged me all my life, teachers and parents and coaches that knew me. But now I had a virtual stranger that had decided to invest in my future. And this was the extra motivation that I needed to help me keep going when times were tough. And his belief in me made a huge difference in how I measured my own worth. So here's my first lesson for you. I want each of you to carry your own tape measure. Don't let other people define how you will measure success. Don't compare yourself to others, but determine your own standards and then work to achieve your own goals in life. So college is also where I learned that you can't do it alone. I had some really great study groups that helped me survive a lot of those engineering classes, and it was really good to have people to lean on. But I do have a few regrets. Um, I wish I had gotten to know my professors better. I wish I had gotten more involved on campus. In my era, there was no Terry Scholar Student Organization. There was just six of us. And even at the end, there was less than 40, and we didn't really mix with each other. So I want you to look at this time as a gift, and I encourage you not to waste it. So ultimately, I did graduate with a degree in mechanical engineering, and along the way, I met my future husband. So in 1991, I graduated in August. I started a new job with Chevron in September. I won't put this on, but this was my very first hard hat. I'm really proud of this. And then I got married in November. So it was a really whirlwind time in my life. Um, those early years were fun and they were challenging. At Chevron, my job title really was project manager. And there was very little training time before I found myself in charge of my own construction projects. Here comes the tape measure again, in real life, but also with those same doubts and insecurities. See, they don't teach you in college how to work with your peers who already have 20 years of experience and you're the new person. And they don't teach you how to get tough with a contractor that you're supposed to keep on target and under budget. So I learned to ask a lot of questions along the way and I learned to be aware of the people who would help me to succeed. But I also realized pretty quickly that the things that had helped me succeed in high school and in college were also going to help me succeed in life. Things like taking personal responsibility, being willing to work hard, having respect for everyone that I worked with, not being afraid to step up and take the lead, but also to be willing to listen to those around me. So I loved my career. And I love the people I work with. Um, I got to build gas stations, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> and then, get this, in the mid-1990s, we started building gas stations with restaurants. It was an inconceivable innovation at the time. At the time, who thought you would go to the gas station and buy a hamburger? 
was just bizarre. So I got to be on one of the first teams in the country to build some of the very first Chevron McDonald's stations right here in Houston. And it was amazing. It was really a whole lot of fun. But guess what happened else? What else happened along the way? I became a mom. Aww. So my husband and I were blessed with uh, two beautiful daughters in 1995 and in 1999, and they changed my life. They really shifted my priorities. So suddenly, climbing the corporate ladder didn't seem quite so important anymore. And my husband, at the same time, was trying to build his career as an accountant in the healthcare field. And suddenly, the pressures of work and family life became enormous. And this is where, for the first time in my life, I felt like I needed a level because things just didn't seem balanced anymore. See, I had bought into the ideal of superwoman, that you can have it all. You can be a wife, you can be a mother, you can have a career, and it's all going to be easy. Except that it really wasn't, at least not for me. And so I want to be clear, I don't want to discourage any young woman here from thinking and knowing and believing that you can have a career and you can have a family. It is possible. I have extreme admiration for the many women that I know that do it really, really well. But there are some trade-offs, and I wish someone had told me that ahead of time so that I would have been prepared. When I realized that my precious girls were spending more time at the daycare than they were with me, it was a really tough reality check. Was I being a good mom? Well, what about my career? And which one was more important? So I think that we all need to find balance in our life, and for everyone that's going to be different. I want you to be aware when your life feels out of balance, and you need to take action to get it back to a level place that feels comfortable for you. You are the only person that can set your priorities. So always be willing to take time to figure out what is most important in your life. So eventually, through a chain of events that's a whole other story just by itself, my husband and I decided together that we would focus on his career and that I would take a break from my career to be a stay-at-home mom. So I quit my job as an engineer and we moved to San Antonio so my husband could take a promotion. And this begins phase two of my life. This was a time of great uncertainty for me. Um, and that friend, the tape measure was never far away. I always wondered if I was going to measure up in phase two of my life. To begin with, my parents couldn't believe that I was walking away from a career that I had worked so hard to have success in. And at the time, I didn't really know any other stay-at-home mom, so it was very isolating for me. I was also worried what the Terry Foundation might think about my decision. What would Mr. Terry think? about my decision to give up my career. And so it was a huge relief and a great honor that about the same time, in 2000, I got a call from Mr. Terry saying that he wanted to add some former Terry scholars to the board of directors and would I be interested. So this didn't actually come out of thin air, although it was a huge surprise to me. When I was a senior, I had been asked to sit on an interview panel. So first class of Terry Scholars, first class of seniors, first seniors to be asked to sit on an interview panel. And then one of the benefits of living in Houston and working in my early career is that I was asked over the years three more times to sit on an interview panel, and those were always on panels where Mr. Terry was sitting at the table with me. And so he knew from early on that I was very interested in staying involved. I also was one of those alum that showed up at the picnic every year that I could. And so I had demonstrated to him my interest in staying involved. Over the next decade, when I was living in San Antonio, I had the flexibility and the freedom, because I was a stay-at-home mom, to sit on an interview panel every year. It's something that I prioritize. And then in 2004, the same year that you guys started the U of H Terry Scholars here, a new chapter started at Texas State, and I took them under my wing 
and I interviewed for the first 10 years every Terry Scholar that entered at Texas State. So I was able to shepherd that program. Here's the life lesson in all of that. People will notice when you are sincere and passionate about what you do. See, I never gave a second thought to volunteering my time back to the foundation. I expected it of myself because I had given my word during that interview to give back to the foundation. Whenever I had the opportunity, I always told Mr. Terry how thankful I was for that opportunity and for his support and that I would be willing to do whatever I could to pay that back. So apparently he was watching all along. So phase two of my life lasted for 12 years in San Antonio and I loved being a mom, but I also wondered every day if I was living up to my potential. I knew that focusing on raising my family was my highest priority, but I always felt like I could be doing a little bit more. So I started volunteering. First in the kindergarten classroom, and then in the library, and eventually I was on the PTA board. And then my second daughter started school, so there were a few hours in the week that I was still free. So I started volunteering at church and in the community. And I learned through this time in my life that leadership and service were still very important personal characteristics for me, and that I could cultivate them I just had to look for new ways to do it. It wasn't going to be in the boardroom or in the corporate atmosphere. I also learned that when you focus your energy outward on others, you become less consumed with worry and doubt and insecurities about yourself. So here's where I picked up a new tool. You guys may have never seen one of these. I decided to put away my tape measure, and I picked up a compass. Now notice, this is an old-fashioned compass. I didn't say the GPS on my phone. <laughs> so what's the difference? A compass is going to point you in the right direction, but it's not going to tell you every turn to take along the path. So instead of trying to measure up to a set of expectations, I began to set my compass on what I thought was most important in life. Now remember, I said faith is woven into every decision up till this point in my life. And so it was at this point that I began to invest more deeply in my faith through personal study and devotion. This time really helped ground me in a more personal faith, and I began to worry less about exactly where I was going to end up and to focus more on the people that were around me. Now, don't get me wrong, there was still some anxiety about what the end was going to look like because, after all, children grow up. Now they are 16 and 20, and the role of a mom changes over time. So I knew that I wasn't going to have that same job, that same role as stay-at-home mom forever. So then what? Was I going to go back to construction? Was I going to go back to school? Was I going to become a teacher? There was no definitive path, nothing that was a certainty, but through all of this, my constant prayer for myself was that I would be open to new doors and be willing to be used when the opportunity presented itself. So early in 2012, my husband began to realize that it was time for him to make a career move. See, he had turned down several promotions along the way that had, would have required relocation. And family was very important to us. And we had really wanted our two daughters to have a stable house and a stable education, just like we had had, growing up and graduating from the same area. Uh, and also in San Antonio, we had been close to our family in all of those growing up years for the kids. So at this point, Amber was nearing graduation from high school, but Ashley was still in junior high. So an opportunity developed back here in Houston, which we thought would be a really good career move for my husband. And while I dreaded moving Ashley to Houston for high school, I knew that it could be an opportunity for me to start a new career. And I was hopeful that I might have some volunteer opportunities here with the foundation. And then in April of 2012, Mr. Terry passed away. They asked me to come speak on behalf of all Terry scholars at his memorial service. A daunting and overwhelming task. So we traveled here to Houston, and my husband was actually able to look into the job while we were here. And in May, he had an interview, and a few weeks later, he had the job. And so I called Ed Cottom and said, guess what? We're moving back to Houston. 
And a few weeks after that, he and Rhett Campbell called me back and said, would you be willing to come work at the Terry Foundation as the first executive director? Things had finally come full circle, and here comes phase three of my life. But here's lesson number three for you. Your college major will not define your path in life. I never dreamed that I would be working at the foundation. Never. I don't have any nonprofit experience. I simply had invested my time over the years in an organization that was important to me. And that passion had turned into an opportunity. It's very likely that many of you will have two or three different careers over your lifetime. What you're doing now in school is really important, and it's going to help launch you to your first opportunity. But after that, be willing to change directions, and don't be afraid of change. So I won't spend too much time talking about my last three years at the Foundation. We can talk about that later if you want. It's been a true honor and a privilege, and a real challenge. Constant change has defined my time at the Foundation. We have doubled the size of the scholarship program since 2012. I love what I do every day, and you guys are the best part of that. I feel like I'm contributing to something bigger than myself and something that has tremendous value for others. So I'm going to wrap up the final portion of my current life in progress. So many of you know that my husband passed away in October of 2014. And you may or may not know that I lost him to suicide. It was a truly unexpected and devastating blow in my life. He was a wonderful father, a wonderful husband, a wonderful friend, a vibrant personality. And I will never know the answers to the questions about why. But what seems clear now is that he lost sight of his value in the world. And he never asked for help. Tragic, really, on so many levels. And losing him has forever shifted my perspective on life. But here's the important lesson. Even in my earliest hours of despair, I knew I needed my compass. I knew that my life had to have meaning, and I knew that I had to keep moving forward. So here I am today, still in phase three of life, working every day to stay strong and to stay positive. I'm learning to work through grief and to be a role model for my girls. It has not been easy, but I have survived. It's a role that I never expected, and certainly nothing that I ever wanted. But it's the circumstance that I have been dealt. And those years of preparing me, particularly cultivating my faith, laid a firm foundation. And so now I have a choice every day, either to live by faith or to live in fear. So I'm going to leave you guys with a few final life lessons. First. Whatever you face in life, do not try to do it alone. Don't be afraid to ask for help. I recently heard that the only thing normal in life is the setting on a washing machine. <laughs> and I'm not even sure that's true anymore because washing machines now is like permanent press. <laughs> so it's okay to not be okay. You hear me? It's okay to not be okay, but just don't do it alone. Your life has value. You are defined by more than your GPA or your job title or your salary or any other measure of success. Don't ever think that the world would be better off without you because I can promise you it's not. And finally, I want you all to start building your compass now. I want you to take the time to figure out what is ultimately important in your life. What do you value? What gives your life meaning? What kind of impact do you want to have on the world? You're going to need those tools in your toolbox. 
I hope that you never have to face the kind of loss that I have faced. And yet I know many of your stories, and I know that some of you already have. You will all face obstacles in your life. So begin now to fill your toolbox with the tools that you're going to need so that when you face a crisis, you have what you need to keep moving forward. And finally, always remember that you are a Terry scholar. Just as Mr. Terry saw something in me, an interview panel saw something unique and special in each one of you, and that's why you're here today. So set your goals high, listen to your heart, follow your dreams, and work hard to maintain balance in your life. Someday each one of you will write your own story, and I know that it's going to be great because I'm proud of you already. So thank you, and I wish you all the best.